like this uh, that are out there of oh, extraterrestrial or a large uh, hairy creature with uh, arms that hang down uh, beside its, be you know, or down on its sides. I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cole. There's not anything from this earth that I'm not quite sure of. You're listening to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran. And this is your place to explore the weird, strange, and unexplained. From cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Coming up on this edition of the Strangeology Podcast is a look into the practice of hypnotherapy and hypnotic regressions in the context of alien abductions and high strangeness in general. So I don't have too many updates for today other than seeing a lot of people talking about the upcoming eclipse that's happening on Monday, April 8th, 2024. This episode is out on April 5th, just for context. I'm actually on the edge of the path of totality for the eclipse, when it goes over New England. Uh, so we got some special sunglass shades to check it out. Uh, it's going to be fun. It sounds like the whole state, or at least the schools across my state, are shutting down because it's expected that almost a quarter million people are going to come flooding into my state from surrounding states and probably beyond to check out the eclipse. So traffic is going to be bonkers because there are barely over 600,000 people that live where I live. So yeah, and I guess a whole bunch of other states in the path of the eclipse are doing this as well with shutting things down, I guess, for crowd control. Now, there are a lot of theories being thrown around on social media that I keep popping up on my feeds everywhere, like how the total eclipse path from 2017 that passed over the U.S. and people are comparing it with this year's, which makes an X over Illinois, Missouri, and Kentucky, where all those state borders and state lines meet. And most specifically, it's kind of like pinpointed right in this town called Maconda in Illinois. It's kind of a, a small town, not really much going on there. And I guess one town has never had an eclipse pass over it twice before. And people are suspicious that it's passing over a bunch of towns named Nineveh. And the 2017 eclipse passed over a whole bunch of towns named Salem. Now, other people think that there might be this three days of darkness following the eclipse since it's going to be on the same date or near the same date, I guess, from our understanding of the biblical three days of darkness from ancient Egypt, which that's kind of wild. I don't know if that's really possible <laughs> unless something totally out there happened. You never know. Probably not. Now, some think some other theories that are out there, some think that like the flat earth will be revealed. NASA is also launching three rockets during the eclipse which has a bunch of people raising their eyebrows as well. Like, why are you launching these rockets during the eclipse? That's kind of weird. But the explanation for that is that they're testing to see if there are atmospheric changes that happen when the eclipse happens and, and the, the moon is going in between the sun and the earth, which is kind of cool. There's some science for you. And then I guess finally CERN, is firing up the Large Hadron Collider again on April 8th. And of course, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about CERN. I should probably do an episode about that at some point. Although scrolling through social media, I was seeing all of these videos because of the algorithm. And then a scientist who actually works at CERN popped up and started explaining that the LHC has already started up and it takes a while to cycle up to full power because it's this ring that's like 17 kilometers long. And it was just a coincidence that the eclipse over America was happening. 
And CERN is in Switzerland, by the way. And as far as I know, they're not going to be seeing an eclipse that day. So I lean towards definitely coincidence, although there are a lot of strange things that people have observed going on with CERN anyway, and all sorts of weird theories. So I'll probably do an episode about that at some point. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on out there with these conspiracy theories. And I love a good conspiracy, but I don't think we really have anything to worry about with this. It's just another celestial event that we get to observe as earthlings. Eclipses happen multiple times a year all over the planet, and we don't really experience the apocalypse whenever it happens. I think the biggest thing we need to worry about are people doing people things. So if you are going to be observing the eclipse, definitely stay safe out there. Use the recommended protective eyewear if you want to observe it, and maybe best to stay out of uh, major population areas if you don't want to get stuck in traffic, you know? All right. Well, that's my spiel on that. It's just a quick reminder. Make sure to set your podcast apps to auto-download so you never miss a new episode of the Strangeology Podcast. And don't forget to follow us over on all of my socials, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc. for more content updates, giveaways, and all that good stuff. Also, for events, the International Cryptozoology Museum Conference is coming up on Saturday, April 27th in Portland, Maine. I'll be vending there, and it's going to be a great time. I'll have a link to tickets in the show notes if you're interested in attending. The next event after that for me is the Withfill UFO Fest in Virginia on Saturday, June 8th, which is also going to be a blast. I think it's the second or third year they're doing it. I've been wanting to go and I'm definitely stoked to to go down there and and check things out. And you can head on over to my website, strangeology.com, to see what other events that I'll be appearing at this year, which so far I think is the most amount of events I've got booked. Um, I'm going to be also at the Whitehall Sasquatch Calling Festival event in September. I just got my application in for that. So yeah, this year is full of events and it's going to be good. Okay, why don't we just get into it? The guest for today's episode is Leslie Mitchell Clark, who is a clinical hypnotherapist that works with people who have had experiences with alien abduction. And it was a very insightful conversation as to just what is going on with this phenomenon and how hypnotic regression can help these people. And just a quick note, the main segment of the show was originally recorded during the late summer of 2023. So my air conditioner was blasting. And since my studio is in the attic of my house, the audio quality might not be the best. It sounds a little funny. I did my best to clean it up, removing background noise and all that. And if you're wondering why it took a while for this one to come out, it's because I had a bunch of things that I wanted to talk about for the members portion of the show. Leslie's schedule at the time didn't permit us to do that extra portion, so we had to reschedule, and now here we are. So without further ado, here's the interview. I hope you enjoy it. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Joining me today is Leslie Mitchell Clark. Just a quick bio on Leslie. She is a Toronto based certified clinical hypnotherapist and runs her own clinic called Lightwork Hypnosis. Among other modalities, she works with people who suspect that they may have had encounters and experiences with extraterrestrial beings and other high strangeness out there. She also practices metaphysical therapies like past life and interlife regression. And beyond this, Leslie has also been an actor, a dancer, a vocalist, a writer, and a top jazz and arts media consultant, and is the author of the book Intersection, A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact. 
So welcome to the show, Leslie. So glad to have you on today. Oh, and, and thank you. Of thank course. you, Jeff. I, I feel uh, exhausted from that, <laughs> from that intro. It's, it's quite the extensive <laughs> resume. How are well, you not doing all today? The, not all those things happened all at the same time. Uh, of so course. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm great today, and I'm and I'm so pleased to be with you and to be with your your uh, listening and viewing uh, audience. And I'm really looking forward to getting into some, uh, you know, arcane material that you're you're not going to hear anywhere else. I mean, I'm I'm kind of you know in a strange way on the front lines of the experiencer phenomena. You know, so uh, I give you uncensored information, uncensored by anybody. From my from my treatment space to your ears. <laughs> well, that's what we want to hear today. Uh, well, first off, when did you become interested in ufology and perhaps more importantly, uh, discovering hypnotic regression for people who believe they've encountered aliens? Oh, my goodness. Well, I would have to say I have always been fascinated with ufology. Uh, started as a little kid with just a ridiculous obsession with sci-fi. I mean, my dad had a telescope and it was, I mean, uh, uh, so it was always uh, something that I was very, very attracted to. And then, you know, when I was like a teenager, then Eric Von Donneken came out with this little, you know, Super 8 film. <laughs> I think it was uh, Chariots of the Gods. And after I saw that, I was, I was gone. You know, that was uh, that was it for me. And I and I because it all resonated the truth. I think the truth resonates inside of us. And if you simply, you know, open yourself up, you'll know when something is, you know, BS and when it's not. You know, I think we have our little internal uh, devices. So this all resonated with me now um, after many years working in the entertainment business and a lot of it. um after my kids came along as a, as a music industry publicist, after doing all that, I, I was having, I guess you could say kind of a midlife crisis. Um, now I didn't uh, go out and buy a sports car and get a mistress, but <laughs> <laughs> my husband was very appreciative of that. But uh, what, what did happen is I was, I wanted to do something fulfilling, but I didn't know what now my husband um bless his heart said you know you're at a, some kind of crossroads you know i think if i bought you a past life regression it would be really helpful and i said well yeah i've never had that ha done I, I i'm completely on board with that so that's exactly what happened now certainly you know the regression was fascinating and there was information that came out and everything that you would hope for and expect but the real uh gem the real treasure that i came away with is something in me knew that i could do that kind of work again like the way the truth resonates it was like oh. now you know hypnosis is over 6000 years old and probably if you believe in antediluvian you know sophisticated civilizations uh pre-flood uh, civilizations, it's probably much older than that. But at any rate, all the major cultures have practiced it. So, you know, it, I believe in maybe one or more lifetimes, this was something that I did. So um, very shortly after that, I, I went and got the, um, you know, I have to call it the basic training that allows you to practice in Ontario. It was about a three month thing. You know, that's about all it was, but uh, it was very intense. And um, following that, then I was extremely interested in uh, learning and being coming certified in the metaphysical uh, hypnosis um, protocols, which, as you mentioned, past life regression, interlife regression, and something called uh, energy or entity release. Now, I don't do that very often, uh, but that is, you know, part of it. So, um, I was working after a while at a very snazzy clinic at a uh, what would be comparable to like, you know, Beverly Hills, uh, you know, in Toronto. It's called Yorkville. And um, it was a lot of these, you know, mostly it was middle aged women who want to lose weight or, you know, it was it was pretty surface as far as 
hypnosis goes. But every once in a while, about every month, someone would call in and say, you know, I have missing time. I'm having strange nightmares. I have marks on my body, da, da, da. And um, no one in the clinic wanted to touch that with a 10 foot pole. They just said, no, I can't. I can't deal with that. And again, something inside me said, you have, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You have to help these people. This is, this is part of disclosure. This is what has to happen. So I started taking on um, any individual who came in. Now, granted, not everybody who you know, comes to see you and feels that they've had an ET experience has actually had an ET experience. So there are a lot of other uh, psychological and psychiatric things that can play into that. So I have to be very careful when I'm using regression. I have to be extremely careful that I'm dealing with an emotionally stable person. Right. So, you know, right away, some of those people who called into the clinic were you know, just, they were not suitable candidates. Now, it wasn't long after that, that um, I began uh, working with Kathleen Martin uh, in her experience or research project. I was one of the mental health practitioners on, you know, who gave them the data, which resulted in uh, their conclusions 10 years later. So I was involved in that, which meant a steady stream of people that had already been screened by MUFON. So by the time these people came to me, I was, you know, I was very comfortable, you know, working with them because um, uh, because they'd already been through a kind of a vetting process and done a report and uh, whatever, whatever else was required. So I became one of the people that did that work for for uh, MUFON's Experience and Research Program. And I also uh, did that kind of work for Free Experiencers, which was uh, the late Dr. Ed- Edgar Mitchell's organization doing the same thing. And yes. uh, now I'm working with I'm. I'm working with Les Velez's organization, which is called Opus. So yes. uh, this is one way that I seem to, you know, get a steady stream of people who are largely viable and fascinating and from all different walks of life. I mean, you talk about diversity. This is a this is a phenomena that um, crosses all kinds of uh, socioeconomic uh, cultural lines, I would have to say. It really is. And um, so that's how I began, you know, working in this area. And of course, that was some years ago. Now, I also have a, a, you know, my own little uh, my own little show called Contact TV that we've been we've been um, airing for about 13 years. So uh, people will will want to reach out to me um, from those appearances or other appearances. So I think the right people just get to me somehow. And and uh, it's possible to do this work on Zoom, which is something that I never could have imagined in my earlier career. Because I mean, you know, we barely had email. You know, it's it's certainly the idea that you can treat people and treat them successfully. And this goes for my entire practice, by the way. You know, during the COVID, um, I never stopped working. In fact, thank God I was working because people were losing it. Yes. Right and left. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the this is what is really wonderful about about technology is that I can work with an experiencer in another country and have done. So, um, yeah, it's great so when the world's at your it. fingertips. Well, you know, it's. I think that I think that with many um, uh, previously uh, sophisticated cultures, I think that every tech savvy culture passes through a phase that's very much like this. I think of I think of our tech as like training wheels because you know before we know it when when we you know we have almost instantaneous communication and uh this is something that uh many of the advanced beings that we engage with are very very good at it seems to be a telepathic universe although many beings can talk just as we can but it's it seems to be a telepathic universe and uh we can talk more about that later but yeah wow all right (laughs) (laughs) i'll take a breath (laughs) yes quite the opener um now uh, uh going back to the vetting process i was curious about that how 
how do you or you know people at MUFON go about distinguishing an authentic experiencer versus someone who may be suffering from a mental illness or isn't uh, genuine in, in what they're yeah, claiming? Or some kind of delusion or what have you. Well, um, I know that with MUFON, they do a really extensive intake. So they do have a big engagement with the person and there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of form filling a lot of um, uh, as much descriptive material as they can get from them so by the time and sometimes they will even go to the area of the sighting with an individual so they may even meet this person because we you know the move on people are regional they're all over the place and that and and that's so an investigator uh, can get to you uh, easily or vice versa so by the time um, by the time uh, MUFON or a like organization recommends someone to me, there's a reason that they're doing it. Uh, generally, they have some suppressed uh, memory. They have some missing time. They, something is not clear. They remember part of something, but not the rest of it. So there's usually a motivating reason when when MUFON would refer me because they want they want the whole picture. So it's a question of will that will that experiencer benefit from a regression experience? Now, some people they report they're just, you know, they they don't report having any, you know, additional encounters other than a sighting. I personally don't believe that there is any such thing as a random sighting. I I, I really don't. I think that they show themselves uh, when they wish to. And um you know, a lot of the times I think that these these craft are just going so bloody fast that we simply can't perceive them with our with our eyes. But I think they have cloaking devices and all of that kind of Star Trek technology. I really do. Um, uh, and I think that some people are chosen for experiences and that they some beings are following a genetic line. So but there are wide there's a wide reason why why encounters happen. Um, wide. Yeah, yeah. Now, so you use this hypnotic regression uh, to help people who are experiencers. How did you go about developing your techniques, and you know how how successful have have they been with okay. helping people out? Well, that's that's a wonderful question, and I'm just going to preface this by at the bottom line I consider myself a healer so my job is to assist the individual in processing the experiences um, releasing fear releasing anxiety releasing trepidation and being able to function comfortably in their linear earth life as well as integrating the experiences. So, and I, there's, there's really, uh, I don't know if there is any such thing as someone who has, who is an experiencer who has not had experiencers for their entire lives. I think most experiencers are lifelong experiencers. And so they tend to have issues that are, um, uh, uh, insomnia, uh, sleeplessness. Now that's because, you know, either, you know, like some of my clients res will say that on some level, they're afraid to go to sleep because they never know what's going to happen. Other clients are just used to being awakened and taken. So the sleep process, I think there are many ETs that don't really understand sleep in the sense of how we need it and require it to get the wipe the sludge off our brains and all the rest of that stuff that that sleep does so um so my main goal in all of this is is the healing the relief the integration of experiencers and the well-being of the individuals who come to me and you know many many of these dear people come and you got to remember you know i'm i'm kind of a last chance texaco in mental health care so, so many of these many of these dear people have been through uh medical and psychiatric explorations and treatments and medications and um, i mean um 
often they're told, well, you're completely sane. We, we, you, you, you're not, we don't really know what's going on. Sometimes they get that. And I appreciate that more than somebody feeling that they are mentally ill. But I've had people just break down in my chair after the, after the memories come up because they realize that it's really real. Often I'll hear that. Is this real? Was this really real? I'll say, this is, it's recorded. This is, these are your recollections. That's your subconscious mind revealing to you what your conscious mind isn't able to hold on to. Right. Or, right. or, or there was some kind of memory suppression. I don't believe that human memory can be suppressed forever. I don't think we're built like that. And uh, most, and, and certainly, I mean, I'll just touch on this for a moment in our collaborative ET collaborative secret space programs. Um, they, they only develop memory suppression that will last for 20 years. And uh, I think that that is actually about average because I have many people in midlife coming to see me and they're just having breakthrough memories. You know, that's, yeah, I, I, there is a, there does seem to be, so, I mean, we're not talking about gods here. We're talking about beings who were just a little bit farther on the technological medical, uh, uh, you know, highway, right? We, yeah. we have, we have got to start thinking of ourselves as, well, it's possible that we could even join in the galactic federation or whatever Gene Roddenberry-esque thing exists. And I think it does, but look at us now. I mean, you know, look at what we do. Look at our, our, our anger and our, and our racism. And we can't even get along with people who are on our planet and, and might have a different perspective or have a variety of appearances. It's, you know, although I must say, I, I'm not going to be negative because the kids that have been coming in, the kids coming in today, unless they've been indoctrinated by negative thinking people, there are some really beautiful young people who have come into our earthly plane, I think, to help us. I think they're set up for tech. Their brains are good at it already. And, um, uh, you know, in, in, with, with my kids as they grow, grew up in Toronto, I mean, zero racism, zero. So there is hope. There is yeah. hope. Yeah. But as a, as a species, I think we've got a lot of work to do. Still a yeah. long way to go, I think. We uh, do. If there is a galactic federation, I would think that they, they would probably want us to iron out those details before. Oh, yeah. Would, and they can't know. do it for us. These are growing pains. They, they cannot do it for us. And, you know, really, we're, we're like three-year-olds with with a flamethrower <laughs> can you imagine we've got nukes and and i'm sure that nuclear activity uh destroys space time in some way that we don't really even understand yet and because they're very the ets appear to be very concerned about that and shut off nuclear stuff all the time yes so yeah. you know There's so many reports of that it's pretty wild <laughs> yeah yeah um, my next question, uh, for you is of the percentage of people that you see, um, are there any explanations like hypnagogic delusions, like sleep paralysis? Do you run into people where it turns out it's actually that versus, yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't aliens? usually, but I don't usually put those people under, I'm, I'm usually able to determine, um, kind of the nature of what's going on simply by, you know, asking the right questions. So, but absolutely people can be very, very, especially now the sleep paralysis thing, this leads to all kinds of wacky stuff, but, you know, sleep paralysis, um, I'll just briefly explain when we go into a certain sleep stage, you know, our body releases uh, paralytics, which actually prevent us from acting out our dreams because the subconscious mind does not know about linear time and it does not know the difference between uh, being awake and being asleep and a lot of different stuff. So if we didn't have this natural paralysis that is part of the sleep structure, part of how it works, we would be walking around somnambulistically, you know, acting out stuff like all night. 
So it's a good thing. Now, there are rare occasions when um, these paralytic chemicals uh, wear off after someone has already become conscious. And now, you know, that is often confused with funny dreams about, de you know, funny dreams about this happening and that happening. And, uh, you know, it, it, that that can be a very disorienting and very frightening experience for people. And undoubtedly, they have some, you know, don't forget, you know, we release DMT when we're dreaming, you know, and um, uh, that is a, a highly psychoactive substance so people can have waking dreams so uh, this sleep paralysis thing i think is um is very frightening and very real but it is essentially part of our natural sleep cycle now there are um there are experiences that people recount to me where they're touched on their forehead or something and and they become numb or they or their whole body goes to sleep. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but um, I get a lot of I get a lot of, um, you know, sleep paralysis stuff that that is confused for something else. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. The sleep paralysis thing is uh, it's a weird one. And uh, yeah, I. Uh, only only ever really experienced it a couple times in my life <laughs> when I was mm -hmm. younger, mm -hmm. um, but uh, never saw any sleep paralysis demons or entities. It was just oh, yeah. being aware yeah. of the room and not mm -hmm. being able to move. And it was just bizarre. It's, it's weird enough just for that to happen. Yeah. But imagine if you're not fully, fully conscious and you're still dreaming and uh, and you're, you know, you're unable to move and it's becomes. Oh, boy. Yeah. People can be very, get very uh, disturbed yeah. from that experience. Now, again, you know, the, um, I'll just have to go back to, you know, my intake, my intake. Um, I never have anyone um, come for an appointment or come over to my little place or uh, un unless I have a very thorough talk with them uh, or intake, as I call it. And I get a history. I get a medical history. And, you know, I kind of know I, I'm an NLP practitioner, too. So if I if I see people like I will have a very good sense that they're being truthful yeah. because I'm looking at those little little tells that everybody has. Right. Um, so by the time I have a good talk with someone, I am pretty, pretty sure if they are either a genuine experiencer or someone experiencing some type of dissociative mental health disorder. And if I if I do come across someone like that, which doesn't happen all that often really, but that if that does happen, I have colleagues, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists who are, you know, infinitely more qualified than myself and I and they're open to the phenomena. So I have people where I can refer um, these individuals on. I don't just let them hang out to dry. I get them to the right people who are able to um, you know, examine what's going on in a different way. So that's great. I get them the I get I try to get them the help that they need. And you know, that help is not me. Now, also, I think you asked this earlier. I should probably have addressed it. I don't think I did. Not everybody can be hypnotized. Not everybody. Um in my case, I'd have to say it's it's around 90% probably that, that I'm able to get into trance, but occasionally you will have someone who was unable to release control or in they, in their mind, they think they're losing control. So they're unable to relax into the situation. And um, sometimes if we do, if we're doing regression work, um, if a person has had a very um, traumatic childhood, they don't always want to look at it and pass through it or explore it in any way. And so they create their own memory block. And I've certainly had that occur, uh, you know, a handful of times. But as long as I've been doing this, which is about, I think about 20 years now, it's amazing how few people um, 
I don't manage to get into some sort of workable trance. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But, you know, you, when you think of a trance, I should probably mention it's not like in the movies. It's um, uh, the the uh, the client or the patient is um, not asleep. They are in the alpha state in between being awake and asleep. Uh, so if I can get the body relaxed enough and I do that just by talking i mean the ancient greeks used to give their their patients a big opiated drink before they started <laughs> well toronto is liberal but not that liberal <laughs> so so uh so i do it all by talking and um once i get the body relaxed enough then i can access the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind is where all memories are stored uh whether the conscious mind recalls them or not, everything's in there. If if someone wants to know what they wore to their uh, to their kindergarten on the first day, it's there, and we can find it. So, unless there's a unless there's a blockage of fear or mistrust, um, from this current lifetime, I can usually get past any kind of resistance. People just have to feel safe. And, you know, once I tell them you're not going to be unconscious, that generally puts a whole different picture on it. And and when I tell them, look, and if at any point you became uncomfortable or um, uh, disturbed or felt weird, you can pull yourself right out of trance. It's It's kind of like coming out of a daydream. It's not as heavy duty as waking yourself up. So, you know, I, I as soon I reassure them and I have a really comfy, comfy treatment space. In fact, uh, I call it the womb room. <laughs> but uh, people's comfort is is everything to me. And, and, and then, the you know, the healing, it's part of the healing. It's part of the healing that that has to go on, and the integration, and the and the the end of uh, disturbing uh, issues of sleep disruption and other things. Right, right. Now, in your clinical experience over the years, with what people are encountering, would you say that these extraterrestrial intelligences? are peaceful and benign or are there some that people have reported that are more negative or malevolent that are out there messing with people? Well, I think we have both going on, but what I will say is um, in the, in the big research projects, again, that MUFON did and Kathy Martin and free, they came to the same conclusion that upwards of 80% of people's experiences are benign. Okay, so we have a, um, a majority of well-intentioned beings who are working with us in different ways, working to wake us up, to help us to be conscious of our environment and our, so, uh, and some of these beings look so much like us that they can, they can literally pass uh, because we're our genome. Uh, uh, we we happen to look very much like the people, the beings that would call themselves Lyrans, and that includes Pleiadians because that's the Lyra uh, system, I believe. So uh, we have a very strong resemblance to uh, certain uh, types of beings, um, and uh, and who was it? And perhaps. Um, uh, but remember that some we're we're also talking about there's an interdimensionality here too, and I'll I'll get to that in just a minute. But so we have the we have the you know we have the really humanoid looking beings. There are benevolent insectoids, and this is a hard one for people to get their heads around. But in fact, they're the insectoids are the genetic masters of the universe. They are the experts. Uh, there are um, there are rip reptilians. Now, we actually and Captain Randy Kramer told me this. You know, he's a marvelous guy. If you've never had him on the show, you should. Uh, but well, he's a uh, he was a, a super soldier uh, experiencer uh, of, of the twenty and back. Uh, the complete uh, military ET situation. He was uh, part of the Mars Defense Force and part of the Lunar Defense Force. So uh, Randy Kramer told me that there are reptilians that we even have uh, treaties with. Uh, 
So again, you know, we, you know, we as 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 mammalian uh, humanoids, we have a lot of trouble with beings that have come along a different chain, like reptilians and bugs. I mean, we're you know, we have a lot of trouble with it. So when ki- when kids are little. Um, and being being taken for benign examinations. Sometimes there are um, there are insectoids involved because they're expert, but they will all they will not let themselves be seen, and they'll wear big capes with hoods. They really don't want to freak us out. They really don't want to freak us out. So yeah, but but there and and of course we have a a uh, you know. Uh, what can I say? A cornucopia of grays. There are all different kinds of grays. There are the zeta reticulites that have long been in collaboration with the U.S. since the Roswell crash. That's when all that. That's when I would have to say that to me uh, indicates the modern era of ufology, um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that that was the first contemporary collaboration where the zeta reticulites, some of them survived and uh, and they made what we call, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Eisenhower Agreement, or, or excuse me, the Truman Agreement, and then later the Eisenhower Agreement. But apparently the zeta reticulites entered into a um, agreement where in exchange for uh, tech that we could handle, uh, uh, which involved like um, um, integrated circuits, uh, fiber optics, Velcro, you know, <laughs> things like that, uh, they would they would be allowed to take a very small amount of human beings to uh, obtain genetic material because they could no longer reproduce. And so um, happily, you know, the terrible stories that have been documented that one has heard so much about uh, women having, you know, ova harvested and men having sperm taken and, um, uh, you know, uh, fetuses being implanted and taken out and this and these things really and truly did happen. These horrible things. However, that agreement, amazingly enough, the Zeta reticulites honored it. It, it. it timed out. I believe it timed out um in in the 80s so now if i work with someone who has had those type of experiences they are often senior you know over over 60 i would say you know it's it's not something it's not something that um that we hear about in present time very often. And I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. I'm not going to disregard anyone's experiences because there are good people and bad people. There are good beings and bad beings. You know, I hate to be so simplistic about it, but yeah, there's there as above, so below. Right. You know, yeah. yeah some, sometimes you have to <laughs> to simplify things to be able to differentiate and figure out What's going on? What's going on? But one thing I will, the one thing I will say, the worst things that I have ever heard about with regard to what happened to children and young men, the worst things I've ever heard about have been the results of uh, human beings collaborating with ETs. So, I, I mean, we have no one to blame for a lot of what goes on but ourselves and a un uh what's the word um when something is not um a, this organization answers to no one and they know it's known that trillions and trillions of dollars have just evaporated well where where have they gone since the 50s the mars defense force and the lunar defense force yeah there's a lot of missing money it's, oh uh, yeah oh yeah and and you know now um i mean people with the tech we have today people are seeing are having sightings on a daily basis there was even a sighting during you know in the late queen's um uh, diamond jubilee um you know the their uh, i suppose raf planes you know did a big fancy thing and a and a ufo clearly joined them Yes, yes, and I remember it, seeing and that. And I think, yeah. boy, that looks like a little congratulations for the Queen from our ET friends. They did something that most people saw, and yet 
we haven't heard about it much, have we? I was watching it in real time and saw it. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Interesting. So you've mentioned people have been children when they get abducted. Mm -hmm. Is there like a, a lower limit of age that you found where people first started experiencing this and does it typically become a lifelong thing or are there yeah. some, some people who only have like a couple of experiences and then they're done? I'd say it is far more common for someone to be a lifelong experiencer and the youngest, and this is probably because of verbal stuff. It may even start earlier, but the youngest uh, I know of is about age two or three. Now, I regress someone once who was a, a, aboard a, a craft and said they were looking at like a there was like a conveyor belt with healthy, happy babies on it. And the babies were being examined and tickled. I mean, it was nothing. It was nothing scary at all. But it was a conveyor belt where the techs, different techs were looking at uh, at these uh, human babies. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've heard all all kinds of stuff. And what I hear about mostly with little kids is um, the physical experiences of being taken to another location seem to be much more common in childhood and youth. It seems that as, as an experiencer ages or whatever, or, or, or whatever happens there, much of what goes on is through bilocation, or I would have to say astral projection in a sense. Um, most of what happens seems to be the ability of the experiencer to to operate in their etheric body. And that's and that's when because in that way they can engage with beings of all different vibratory levels, if you know what I mean. Um, the the reason again why we sometimes don't even see beings or craft is because you know the they the molecules are just vibrating too quickly. Right. Which is the very definition of of light matter and spirit matter. You know, the vibration is high and it's not just high from an emotional standpoint. It's literally high. So um, some experiencers um, have um, have implants that are benevolent, that are designed to, uh, to be kind of like step up transformers. And help the individual to either, you know, bilocate or, or or what have you. But but children tend to be taken uh, physically, and maybe that's because they're monitoring physical growth. I'm not. I'm I'm re really not sure. But also, many experiencers report to me that they are in when they're really little. They're in classes, and they're learning to do all kinds of stuff. All kinds of uh, they're learning to move things around with their mind. They're learning, you know, they're there. There is a. There are classes that are obviously stimulating the more metaphysical aspects of the brain and the consciousness. Interesting. And is this um, kind of, does this suggest that maybe newer generations of humans are potentially like their frequency is trying to be to raise us to the next level. Or I think like that. that that, I think that that is what happens to beings. I think that with consciousness, imagine, um, just imagine if you can, for even a minute, if, if, if the world was devoid of hate and poverty and hunger and illness, you know, if, if, uh, if we, if we were able to resonate without any of that pain that we now have in our current world, we have to alleviate the pain first to rise above it. We can't, we have to care for our fellow, fellow beings. And I think that in their way, they're trying to care for us too, to, to a certain extent. Um, I think that, um, well, I should tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about um, a child uh, experience. So this this is actually uh, it might be I think it might be in in my book because it's about Wes Roberts, who's the experiencer that I uh, collaborated with on this book project. So um, Wes had been taken his whole life from the earliest baby time. I mean, he was a very easy hypnotic subject and we went 
you know, right back to the beginning of his experiences. It was a lifelong situation. He um, um, told me, he remembered rather an experience where uh, he had been removed from his room physically and uh, a lot of the a lot of the times the beings that come to remove you are grays they seem to be very good at it and they collaborate here and there neither good nor bad but they will they will come and uh and <laughs> do the actual levitating so he remembered being levitated right through uh right through the roof so already his vibration had been altered so he was passing between the molecules <clears throat> if you will and uh, with kids, often a lot of uh, screen memories are used or staging, if you will. So in this particular occasion, it was supposed to look like a birthday party, right? So all they were, he was taken, he showed up in a place where all these, you know, the kids were all sitting around in chairs in a circle. Some of the kids he recognized from other experiences. Some of the kids seemed to be completely asleep just turned off like that but some were awake like him so it was a circle of kids supposed to be a birthday party now they became aware that every so often one of the kids had to go in this in in the smaller room and um i think it was for a you know a physical examination right so so at a certain point <laughs> this door opens and um, coming out of the small room is a, a being in, in a doctor's coat and wearing a clown mask. And all the kids went crazy because they were afraid. Onophobia is one of our biggest fears, fear of clowns. Yep. And, and my guy, Wes, really went nuts. I think he threw a chair or something. And then within a few seconds, his whole body went bam and he was dropped out dropped down in his bed from a kind of a height he thought wow so um you know the ets who work with us don't always know everything about us so they thought oh we'll make the kids comfortable we'll put our we'll put our insectoid doctor or whatever in a clown mask bad plan and uh, sometimes when people are telling me ab about an experience and it's clearly a screen memory or some type of construct, there will be um, there will be uh, objects that are clearly from the wrong time. In other words, like you might see an old black metal telephone like my grandparents had. But the last time they were around was in the 50s. Right. So there are anachronistic things that always give away that it's a, a, a screen memory. Now, and a screen memory is uh, like an implanted memory to cover the experience for people yes. so they don't necessarily yes. remember. Yes, it's a technique. kind of a, it's a kind of a psionic technique um, uh, where the environment that they want to create, the artificial environment, they project somehow into the consciousness of of the beings around now there i've heard that there are some there are some very naughty reptilians who will use that same uh, same uh, psionic technique to project images of having much bigger troops than they do interesting like, yeah so uh, psionics is another skill that seems to be common in in uh, in our uh, in our corner of the galaxy at least yeah. but uh, yeah, so they they I believe that the beings are skilled at projecting through telepathic means an image, or maybe they even manifest or create a temporary reality. I'm you know it's it's very difficult to know exactly how this works, but it certainly is used to cover the experience, uh, drape it, if you will, in, in, a, in a piece of cloth so that you can't easily detect what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember reading an article recently uh, within the last few months where scientists were experimenting with implanting dreams and reading dreams in, in people's yes. subconscious. So this yes. is a, you know, yes. a technology that it, that's like in even before infancy on our yes. level, but a, a species that's 
tens of thousands, a million years ahead of us would probably be able to do it without any issues uh, seamless, that's, seamlessly. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah. And we can do a lot of things psionically with the right training. I, I would say that remote viewing is almost a kind of psionic training. And and then Randy Kramer himself is uh, offers psionic courses. He teaches military grade, marine grade psionics. So um, it is something that we maybe were able to do once and we'll do again, perhaps. Yes. You know, yes. we're, we're, don't forget, you know, we're, we're a planet of global amnesia. We do not understand our past, our deep past. And, and the earth has been through several big cataclysms. You know, not only the Ice Age, but the Young Dryer event, perhaps meteor showers that wiped out the dinosaurs. I mean, it's uh, our our planet has been through a lot of stuff. And um, it's amazing that we have the megaliths still with us that can be studied and hopefully someday understood. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know? a whole, whole big topic. Oh, that um, is, that isn't I love it? I looking into. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm wondering, um, of the experiencers that you've you've worked with, are there any commonalities uh, as to, you know, or markers that could mm. explain, you know, why are these certain people being targeted for abduction and examination and, and experimentation? Is there Are there any similarities between these people? Well. I have to say that the big one, and I think maybe the most important one, certainly, is all of these people have what I would call extremely high PSI ability. They're, these people are naturally quite psychically gifted, and they usually have had other paranormal experiences too, you know, seeing entities and things that are not to do with ETs. But they they seem to all have that experience and um even the men you know it's it's I, I this is this is going to sound sexist and i think it's really pretty much environmental because men have not been allowed to show their feelings or be sensitive or travel into esoteric areas it's much more acceptable for women to do that so um it might be a little harder to get a gentleman to admit his interesting dreams or having the experience with his grandfather coming to visit him, you know, but those things are invariably there. Sometimes I'll find someone who knows enough about their own history that they can trace, you know, the psychic abilities all the way back several generations, many generations, because uh, often, uh, and I think maybe more commonly, psychic ability tends to run through the female lines which is why, you know, the old cultures always had the wise woman, you know, the psychic wise woman healer. I think um, I think it may be genetically easier to carry or manifest that gene. and But that could be, of course, complete BS. It's just a question of how we have been raised. So um, but in in my way of uh, in my way of understanding how the psychic ability ability expresses itself, the women are often very much more forthcoming about, yes, my grandmother had this experience and she used to see, you know, apparitions and, and my great grandmother, blah, 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 was the healer in a small village. So women are generally have more knowledge of it because it can, these things can in some way be passed from mother to daughter. Yeah. And uh, um, even the skill sets of working with herbs and doing that, these things are traditionally passed from mother to daughter rather than from father to son. Not sure why, uh, but but the men still have the abilities, and uh, if if I can make them feel comfortable enough, they will begin to tell me about those related experiences of high strangeness. Yeah, yeah, that's um, it, that that definitely makes sense. Um, thinking of my own my own mother and uh, mm -hmm. her, even one of my sisters, you know, having paranormal experiences growing up i did as well my audience has heard <laughs> heard those experiences of, of mm -hmm. mine ad nauseum so i won't repeat them here but uh yeah that's um that may, that makes a lot of sense that i think it's, it's really i think it's really right down the middle and of course as a <laughs> practitioner of past life 
regression. Certainly, I believe in reincarnation. And we go into female or male bodies. You know, we we do. We have to have both experiences to be a rounded, experienced soul who can help others and service others and love others. We need both sides of the coin. I believe that, you know. So I, I think I find it um, appalling and um, that there is so much uh, misunderstanding of transgenderism. It's completely possible for someone to slip into a male body who is actually much more comfortable being a woman. Yeah, for you know, sure. For this sure. Hap this absolutely happens. And in the past, no one talked about it. But now we have the science to help these people to live happy, uh, fulfilling lives as their um, as their genuine selves. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, there's uh, but I think as far as psychic abilities that that's a that's the huge commonality. Now, they also usually have common um, complaints. Some some of these people have um, a lot of trouble with their immune system. They 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 get sick a lot. Um, their insomnia is a huge problem for the reasons I mentioned earlier, either just by habit of being taken then or fear of being taken. So the insomnia, big problem. Um, uh, they may have uh, marks on their bodies from implants. A very common mark is a triangle, uh, a tiny triangle. You can um, um, that's extremely common. And uh, as I told you, I don't I don't think implants are are negative at all. Not not from what I have heard from my clients explanations, um, you know, and, and we don't need tracking dots because every brain has a unique energy signature and they figured that out a long time ago so they're not tracking dots it's not the government it's not you know whatever anyway so um and um there may be there may be um one or more sibling who has also been taken and had experiences um uh, that will sometimes occur One one client I know was was regularly taken along with with one of his brothers, but the brother put up a big stink every time and was a lot of trouble. And then they just stopped taking the brother. And now he claims to have no memory of any of it and won't, you know, doesn't either uh, probably just won't acknowledge it, won't discuss it. But uh, after after about age 10 and this this kid being so difficult, they just exclusively took my client instead gotcha because gotcha. he cooperated and and wasn't afraid really yeah 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 and it's it's an interesting thought just popped into my head these beings are trying to help us but at the same time they're taking people without really consent and so i understand people who are like no i don't want to be here and uh, it's, mm -hmm. I guess, good that they were like, okay, we don't want to deal with, with that kid. Um, yeah, he's too much. He may yeah. have the biological stuff we're interested in, but he's a lot of trouble. Well, I think a lot of agreements are made when we come into this physical life. I think that there are agreements in place where we are here to help with disclosure. In fact, you know, I... I call, you know, people who kind of do what I do, midwives of disclosure. You're a midwife of disclosure. We are, you know, we are helping to bring about the birth of a of a new era. And um, it may not happen in our lifetime, but obviously the disclosure experience, I think the ETs have become completely disillusioned and frustrated with any kind of any governments. I'm not going to point the finger at one given government in particular. As Canadians, we're in bed with the U.S. government. Everything we do is parallel and together. You know, it's it's. I'm not condemning one, but I think they have given up on that kind of idea. And so, disclosure is really um, a grassroots movement. And you've got guy like Stephen Greer who is leading people through amazing experiences in which they have phenomena happen and appearances happen. So there's an incredible group of people working at Mount Shasta, and uh, boy, they have they have some incredible stuff going on there that is uh, absolutely mind bending. So we're here to bring in a new era, and I personally believe myself that I made some kind of agreement to do this because it is felt so right 
from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of ties in too with um, the cyclical nature of reality and Mm -hmm. reincarnation. Mm -hmm. We come into this world and perhaps there's uh, we we pick and choose on the other side what our life is going to experience, whether that's a short life, a long life. Hanging out with, <laughs> yeah, know, having a family or yeah, or smoking joint, smoking weed all day, you know. <laughs> right. we, but we do we there are planning sessions from what from what I hear in interlife regression is what is extremely fascinating because it's exclusively about the period of time before we come into this current incarnation, and that's where you know and and one of the mind bending things that happened early on to me and my crew is people would describe meeting their councils, which would be, you know, evolved beings that were there to help, not to punish you, but to help you plan your next life and analyze what went wrong, what went right. And I started to ask these, my, my, um, uh, my clients to describe the council members to me. And it became fairly obvious that there are many ETs involved with people's councils and in fact just walking around on what we would call heaven or the other side so evolved beings seem to be able to move between our third density you know the dense physicality and that beautiful uh layer of vibration where we release that and we release all the bad stuff and uh and we can engage with ets in that way so there is this element of interdimensionality is 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 huge another thing i'll say just very quickly is um a gal that i was working with had a um lifelong experience with a ET that was very humanoid who knew her and would look after her and came and visit her, visited her and took her here and there. And um, so they were in a craft, they were in a big mothership far out there. And, and my client said, can you show me, can you show me where you're from? And uh, the being said, well, I can show you the area but you won't be able to see the planet because it's operating at a different frequency that your your eyes cannot your physical eyes cannot perceive. Hmm. So we are surrounded by life, you know. Dig it. We're surrounded by life, not only physical life that we can see, but viable interdimensional life that is engaging with us when we are in altered states of consciousness. Yeah. Wow. Big stuff for sure. Big big stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But very cool. And as I said, remember everybody out there, please remember that most experiences are, are either wonderful or benign. And we need to move away from fear, fear about, about engaging with people who might not look exactly like us, fear of the unknown, because we've all been to this place before. We're just doing it again. And let's hope that we get it right this time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a very fascinating conversation Leslie, thank you so much. Oh, Jeff, thank you. I really (laughs) enjoyed talking. You're so knowledgeable and open and accepting. And um, I I will be um, happy to come visit you again anytime. And uh, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, I always uh, respond. It may take me a minute, but if you just want to ask a question or you're not sure if you have something going on or not you can always reach me at leslie l-e-s-l-e-y at lightworkhypnosis.com or you can always send me a message right through my website just go to lightworkhypnosis.com and we have a little way to do that so whatever you want to do do get in touch i will always uh respond as soon as i can (laughs) (laughs) wonderful wonderful great well we'll have you back on the show again sometime Thank you so much again for coming on today. Thank you, Jeff. It's been my pleasure. You take care. And remember, we are not alone.
Thanks again to Leslie for coming on the show. Definitely check out her website. I'll have links in the show notes for all of that. And if you or someone you know may be experiencing this kind of high strangeness, the abduction phenomena, and don't know where to turn, there are people like Leslie who are out there to provide support. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone out there who checks out my show. Those of you who download it, share it with friends and family around social media, it really helps the show out a ton when you do that. The Strangeology Podcast really wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. And if you're looking for a way to support the show and what I'm doing here, you can always check out my Patreon, which you can join for as little as $1 per month. I've got a number of different tiers with increasing benefits. You get things like shout outs, early access to episodes, along with access to the ad free version of the show and Strangeology Beyond, which is the members only episode extension, which is sometimes a whole episode in and of itself beyond the normal topic of the main show. There's also merch discounts to my Etsy shop, exclusive merch voting power for topics that I will research and cover. And there's even a t-shirt of the month club. If you enjoy my home state cryptids collection, you get a new shirt every month and I've got dozens of different designs. So it's a good time and you should definitely check it out. And speaking of shout outs, I'm going to give a quick shout out to all current members of the Patreon. Shout out to Alex Chad from Appalachian Huntsman, Mike, Sean C., Miranda, John, Maureen, Gail, Adam, Ryan, Angie, Daniel from Blue Room Insight, Easton Hawk, Guy, Megan, Jeff from Map and Black, Into the Wildwood, Miguel, Albert, Nicole, Shane from Inquiries of Our Reality, Britt, Lene, Carlos B., Son of the Wolf, Zach A., Laura, Zach S, Scott, Larry, Ivan, Chris K, Kurt, Chris J, Brandon, Carlos S, Michelle, and Barbara. You all rule, and thank you all so much for your continued support. It helps the show, and it means the world to me. And one more time, if you want to join this ever-growing community of fellow lovers of the Fortean, the strange, the weird, the unexplained, head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. To any advertisers or companies out there looking to collaborate with the Strangeology podcast, or if you are an author, researcher, experiencer, and would like to be considered for an interview on the show, please send all business inquiries to info at strangeology.com. And one more time, make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts. You can find me again on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, X, and Threads. If you're ever looking for more content from me or want to know what I'm up to, definitely check that out. Occasionally, I also host merch giveaways over on my Instagram, so you'll definitely want to follow me there. All the links will be in the show notes. And if you're looking for another way to support the show, I also have merch. So I'm hoping this year to launch my own standalone store. It's kind of been a back burner project for a while, but for now, you can head on over to my Etsy shop at strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid, alien, and otherwise Fortean gear that is available, and I'm frequently adding in new designs, so you want to check back often. You can purchase items like t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, which warmer weather is coming, so you're probably going to want to rock some cryptid tanks. And I've also got stickers, magnets, prints, mugs, enamel pins, and more. I'm probably forgetting some stuff. I'm also hoping to add some embroidered patches and more enamel pin designs this year. So be on the lookout for those. Again, the link is strangeology.etsy.com. All right. I think that's all from me for now. I'm going to take a quick break here. And when I come back, Leslie was able to return for the Strangeology Beyond segment of the show to discuss what is going on with the secret alien super soldier program revealed by Colonel Randy Kramer. It was really interesting and you're not going to want to miss it. 
patrons stick with me and for everyone else until the next time take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange Welcome back, uh, members, to Strangeology Beyond, your members-only exclusive portion of the show. This is a little bit of an, uh, a different scenario.